this, let's take on, on the right there. If you could say who you are. Yeah, Josh Busby, University of Texas. My question's for Amy. Um, for your mapping of road data, do you uh, recommend a particular data source, for example, that has comprehensive Africa-wide uh, continental data? Um, and how do you compare road types between countries? Uh, we, we had done some previous work to try and incorporate that into vulnerability maps. And we noticed that like uh, category one road, and I may be getting the, the, the differentiations wrong, but uh, category one in the DRC was a dirt road, and that same road might have been a multi-lane paved highway in South Africa. And so if you do a representation using ArcGIS or what, any other kind of mapping software, you have wildly um, unrepresentative uh, maps of the actual road networks if you did it that way. So I'd be curious to see if you have some great data source that I'm unaware of. So yeah, I mean, that's obviously a, a ongoing question we're working in developing countries. Um, we were lucky to obtain some really great data from the International Road Federation um, based in Geneva. And they um, have kind of taken the, or I guess, I don't know if we modeled our approach off them or just happened to, to match up quite well, but they, um, had to, they have the nine road classifications, so paved, gravel, and unpaved, um, primary, secondary, tertiary. And then um, based on country road inventories, they actually put the kilometers into um, their road classification. So if, you know, a, a level one in DRC is really a secondary um, gravel road, that's how it's sourced. Um, some of it we estimated based on population data, um, road density data, uh, geography, um, and we have, I have a paper actually I can show you some more detailed um, how we did that, yeah. Okay, we, we have to have a little structural adjustment here. Um, I've been asked that the presenters can come and answer questions from here so we can get them on film. So, Innocent, can you come up here? Thank you. Let's, while they're coming, take Adam, next question in, in the middle. Yeah, uh, Tara. Uh, thank you all for um, your talks. They were, again, very, very, uh, well, put a lot of more questions than I have answers in my head right now, so I'm going to stick to one question. Um, and maybe it's just I misinterpreted your statement, Amy, so I, maybe it's more of a clarification question. At one point in your talk, you said something along the lines of that the threat, I guess, to, uh, of, of climate change on infrastructure is far greater in developing countries than developed countries. And I guess the, the devil's advocate in me <laughs> sort of throws out this, this thought is that in developed countries, we have such a dense infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And with that, I would, I would maybe contend that it's, it's a very costly infrastructure to repair. Mm -hmm. That is it a case of quantity over expense? In other words, yes, developing countries are certainly more vulnerable to the threat of an extreme event mm -hmm. in terms of destruction. But in terms of the actual sort of loss of you know, productivity or work hours or just in the cost of, of, of rebuilding, do the developing, or do the developed countries, are they just as vulnerable, susceptible to, to damage? Um, I guess is my question. Before Amy answers, can, Adam, sorry, can you say who you? Oh, Adam Slosser, I'm at MIT. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, thank you for the question. That's a good clarification. Um, I think you definitely are right in that um, given the amount of infrastructure in, main develop, in developed countries, um, there is a potentially huge cost burden and it is something to be concerned about. Um, I was speaking more from both the opportunity cost um, and also looking at the development priorities and kind of from a more holistic development perspective. Um, a lot of my research is really focusing um, on the social impact of infrastructure and how does infrastructure affect development. Um, I think that what I mean by that really is that developing countries um, face a huge burden because they don't have a lot of roads. There's not a redundant network. So if a flood does come and wipe out one of the major roads, what, what does that mean to, to commerce, to transport? Um, can be, 
can be a, a greater impact than a developing country. Obviously, if a highway is wiped out, that's that's bad. Um, but we have the the ability to repair that. It may only take a few a few months, few weeks, um, ideally, to get that back online. And there's other routes that can be can be used. In developing countries, if there's only one or two major roads that are wiped out, um, your transportation can stop. I know in Mozambique um, in 2000, there was significant flooding, and it took, I think, close to a year to repair some of those networks. Um, so I think that's what I mean by more the relative threat, um, not necessarily a completely less costly threat, or that it shouldn't be of a concern to a developed country. So thanks for the clarification. Thanks. And this question is back. Can you say who you are? Thank you very much. My name is uh, Jagadi Adimala Olubarodi. Uh, my question is uh, it's about he, he, RC. I want to find out if, uh, how do you become a member of the AERC network? Is it open or is it by invitation? And the other thing is, how do you, uh, talking about the training, web, web training, how do you access it? Is, is it an ongoing process or uh, how do you participate in it? Um, now, uh, the, the um, membership to the ARC network is open and it's ongoing. Um, we always uh, have new members coming on, on, on stream, and uh, the, the application process is very, very simple. Uh, you need to go onto our website and have a, a project idea uh, you know, that is tractable, that uh, will be reviewed. And uh, then you join what we call our thematic uh, uh, research groups that accept applications on an ongoing uh, uh, basis. Now, in terms of the training, the uh, climate change training, um, this was one session. As I said, uh, we, we were hoping to just have one session of about 25 participants. But the demand was such that we ended up having to run three sessions. Uh, and how we did that was uh, we basically sent the um, uh, expression of interest not only to network members but also to all of the institutions affiliated with ARC. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't advertise in countries, uh, uh, in the local press, but uh, the advert was on our website. And that also was linked to the UNUI website, I think. Thank you. Yes, there's a question in, in, in the middle. Uh, yeah. Okay. Th thank you very much for the very excellent presentation. Uh, my Can question you say is, who you are, Wisdom? Okay. My name is Wisdom Akpalu, and uh, I'm a, I teach at the State University of New York, and I'm a Ghanaian. Uh, so my question is to Emmy. Uh, we know that as we look into the future, we, we, uh, we try to forecast the climate, we may have an average number, which you might have used. What does the bounds look like? Uh, because these numbers may be based on maybe the average climate projections into the future. So d did you do anything to calculate the bounds of these uh, values that you, you, you gave, or you, these are just average numbers? Because the bounds could be important. The second thing is that, uh, uh, are these numbers discounted because we're looking into the future? And if they are discounted, uh, how were the discount rates uh, chosen? Because some countries are obviously poorer than others, and they may have uh, different social discount rates. So were these considered in your computations? Um, firstly, for the 10 country study, those in the Pan-African study that I presented, um, we did not use a discount rate. Um, I think that's something we could have definitely improved on um, and that we work to incorporate. Um, when we have used this with specific country studies, um, we've used the discount rate they want. So some countries um, and some, we used with the Asian Development Bank, they had a specific discount rate that they consider kind of their institutional standard. Um, and for the other, que uh, the other question, I want to clarify what... Um, numbers, when you say the averages or the means, what are you, which ones are you referring to? I'm referring to the fact, okay. I'm referring to the fact that to, to compute these values, you have to do some, use some projected numbers for the, clim uh, for, for the climate or what you expect the okay. climate to be. And these numbers have bounds. You have variation around these numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we get specific climate projections, um, say, you know, over a monthly rainfall for you know the 2020 decade um, and we we use those variations and then we say based on that 
one GCM, what does that do and what are the numbers? And then we run it for several GCMs. So the numbers that you'll see um, generally will use the, the quartiles. Um, we'll use the 25th percentile, 50, 75, and the most extreme, um, and represent those numbers. The ones that I displayed, um, some of them were the most extreme and some of them were the mean. Um, usually we run anywhere from six to 50 um, GCMs, and then we do the histogram presentations um, or look at the mean and the most extreme and what are the variations. And that's really where we see um, like those histograms and some of these other metrics being really useful because um, from what I understand, the climate science side of it is there's a, a large variation in GCMs, but that doesn't mean that any one is, is more correct than the other. And the, we think that those, depending on the policy, if you want to you know, reduce your risk completely or have a no regret situation, um, and that's completely adjustable. We have all the results and kind of what you're looking for can be displayed. So. Yes, my name is Krishna Tiwari from Nepal. Uh, I have to ask the first presenter about the, my college also started the, this, uh, the climate change course, uh, but uh, uh, you talk about the, this course and the research for the capacity enhancement, how the new, uh, like our college to participate, like our Eastern our faculty can participate this type of course. Uh, yeah. So I want to yeah, ask. So we, we've done the course, we've run the course for three sessions with the UNU wider and the AARC. Uh, so now we're looking towards the spring, it will be offered for a small fee now that we're going to put out. So the, the climate and civil systems uh, group is going to take it over. We're um, revising some of it, improving some part of it. Uh, and you can see me to make sure that I have your email and, and we'll, we'll be um, revising it to put it, offer it out for a fee and then hopefully try to advertise in different networks. So I would be great to, to get your information. Thanks for that, yes. Um, uh, Philip Adams, I'm uh, from Australia. I'm an economist, right? So that just marks me as somewhat separate from uh, scientists, for example, and I know nothing about roads, but I'm going to ask a question about roads. All right. Uh, so if I thought uh, about roads and, and the future, one of the key variables perhaps I would be thinking of is uh, population movement. Mm -hmm. um, if, a, if an area is going to experience rapid population movement compared to what it otherwise would have, then one might have thought that its infrastructure and road needs, et cetera, would be uh, increased. Mm -hmm. Now, climate change uh, potentially will have climate, uh, uh, population movement uh, effects. Uh, your Vietnam example is, is probably a good one, mm -hmm. where um, possibly people will be moving away or uh, to uh, Mekong or away into the, 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 Red, um, uh, the Red River Valley, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. To what extent does your analysis um, go from climate change to population movement to uh, infrastructure uh, need changes? Hmm. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, the analysis for Vietnam that you saw, we ran based on current road infrastructure. Um, we didn't assume any new road infrastructure being built. Um, we have designed the system so that if a national, you know, national planners are saying, we anticipate growth in this area, what would that look like under climate change? You just change the road stock input. Um, we, we don't do specific modeling in population growth um, or population movement. It's not our area of expertise, but the system is built to be very flexible in the sense that if that is something that is of a particular desire for a planner, um, we can easily incorporate that information and do projections. And that's where it becomes a planning tool, saying, you know, if we are anticipating growth in, in the Mekong area, you know, up from the south, how would that investment look? How would that affect, you know, if we're going to invest, you know, 10% versus 50%, what is the climate change impact there? What do we need to be aware of? Um, should we build gravel roads or paved roads? Um, and that really, the system is designed to be completely flexible, although we don't do that part of the analysis. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes. 
My name is Nidhi. I'm from Leibniz University, Germany. I'm a geospatial analyst by training. So my concern is uh, you talked about integrating GCMs. Did you also try uh, parallel analysis with RCMs or local climate models? Because as you say that GCMs introduce a lot of uncertainty at a regional or local level. And another alternative would be also to see that you use a bit of ensembles, that's multimodal ensembles, which have a particular emphasis of Climate, climatic factors that impact infrastructure to a better extent than the climatic factors that impact other systems. Yeah, I mean, I think those could be useful. We don't use those right now. Um, one of the ways that we have dealt with kind of the um, avoiding the overly um, particular results, given that it's like a higher level modeling, um, we, so in an administrative region, say at a provincial level, there's a certain amount of road stock. We assign um, the percentage of road stock and the GCM projection. So if there's a certain increase in rainfall, it's projected to increase a 2% degradation. We do that over 2% of the road stock in that area. So kind of averaging out to reduce some of that um, in a way that we we feel kind of doesn't get so specific that we're giving false results, um, but does average out the impact of climate change, especially because in, in roads, um, generally the budgeting is done at a very high level. So if you can say, you know, this, this region is gonna experience more <coughs> degradation, therefore it will require more funding, that's very different than saying this one road will be wiped out this one year. Um, and we, we look at it more from, I guess, more of the average um, perspective over a planning period. Thank you. I, I don't see other hands going up. I, I want to, I don't know, use or abuse the, the chair since we've got a few minutes left. Partly addressing, it, I, I think, perhaps a, a naughty question or irresponsible question to uh, particularly Alyssa and, and, uh, and Innocent. In a way, connecting yesterday, those of us who went to Lant Pritchard's uh, lecture raised these kinds of issues and I was thinking about it also in the plenary this morning when there was a talk uh, uh, several people said uh, there's a need to make things accessible to the policy makers uh, there's a complaint that particularly economists are too complicated for policy makers to understand and really one of the issues that comes in, in fact innocent you mentioned disconnect between policy makers and the analysts and so on. One of the questions comes with capacity building. Uh, we focus on the supply side, but there's a question of the demand side. How do you build up the demand so that, in my experience, you know, politicians don't want a, a big model, they want a number, and they want a sound bite. Uh, how do you get uh, politicians to get serious? Isn't this something we should be addressing on the capacity building side with your program. Maybe you should have a program just for policy makers, <laughs> politicians. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a question or a... <laughs> You're right, it was, it was a naughty question. Uh, <laughs> I, I think actually um, the ARC has, has long been trying to do this through uh, the senior policy seminar series where um, only um, senior politicians and uh, uh, technocrats at a very high level are invited every March around the last weekend of March. Uh, and, um, you know, issues to do with not only uh, the, 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 the technical bits where we give results of, of the work, but also where we, we try to raise consciousness about issues. Uh, is done. So I think in a way you could say, yes, uh, we, we try to do that. Uh, the, the only problem is uh, uh, that politicians uh, think in, 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 in four or five year cycles, you know, uh, I get elected today, I have four, four years or so, uh, I want to see the number in, you know, that can assist me in, in, in that period. So sometimes it's very difficult to uh, to get traction you know, for, uh, for issues that have a much uh, slightly uh, longer term than, than, than their terms of office. Uh, but uh, we certainly try to do that. And um, 
And unfortunately for climate change, uh, we still some way uh, to off to building real understanding of what the issues are and what the numbers are. But part of the reason why we, we, we mounted this course was because, um, you know, Africa is involved in all of these discussions, but there is very little capacity to actually participate in these discussions. Uh, and and so, so we have a, a, a dual problem, you know, uh, A, to create the capacity and B, to get that capacity to be useful to the policymaker, whilst at the same time we're trying to build consciousness uh, in the policymaker. So uh, it's, it's quite a task, but we're trying the best we can. Well, I think we've managed to use our time. Uh, I don't know if we beat the other rooms to coffee, but I, I think I'm going to stop it there. If we've got, it, is, it is time to stop. Uh, coffee upstairs. Thank you to our presenters and to you for the presentation.